Hello, I'm Ted Seides, and this is Capital Allocators. This show is an open exploration of the people and process behind capital allocation. Through conversations with leaders in the money game, we learn how these holders of the keys to the kingdom allocate their time and their capital. You can keep up to date by visiting capitalallocators.com. Over the last decade or two, no asset class has generated as much interest and investment dollar returns as private equity. This eight-part miniseries, Private Equity Masters, is a set of conversations with some of the longtime leaders in the space. We'll hear their stories, those of their firms, and their perspectives on this all-important area of the capital markets. My guest on today's show, the fourth episode of Private Equity Masters, is David Rubenstein, the co-founder and co-chairman of the Carlyle Group. Founded back in 1987, Carlyle is one of the world's largest and most diversified global investment firms with $260 billion in assets under management across three business segments from 29 offices around the world. Our conversation covers David's start in private equity, growing Carlisle from the early days, raising capital skillfully, recruiting talent globally, and managing a public company. We then turn to David's outlook for the industry, advice for CIOs, and his recent activity across his family office, writing, philanthropy, and interviewing. Please enjoy my conversation with David Rubenstein. David, thanks so much for joining me. My pleasure. Now, I know you've talked quite a bit about your early career as a self-professed mediocre lawyer, a passion for public service and getting booted out of the White House, and then finding your way by reading this article about Bill Simon and private equity. Why don't you take me back to how it is that you come to read about a successful deal and decide you're going to start a firm? Well, Bill Simon's deal was epic. There weren't that many buyouts at that time. He had bought something from RCA called Gibson Greeting Cards. He paid uh, a couple hundred million dollars for it, I believe. And most of it was borrowed money. In those days, this is the early 1980s, leveraged buyouts were 5% equity or 1% equity. And very often the 1% equity deals, you would take a 1% fee. So you basically got your (laughs) money back. There was very little money left in the deal. And those deals worked wonderfully until the economy went down in the late 1980s. But until then, people made a lot of money. In his case, it got an enormous amount of attention because in 18 months, he put in roughly a million dollars. I'm not sure how much he had left in it after the fees and everything. But for his million dollars or a little bit less than a million dollars, he made roughly $80 million. And I said, I don't know what that leverage buyout is, but it's better than practicing law. I had never been honestly interested in making money. I grew up in a modest family. Money wasn't a big thing. And I just had never focused on. I was interested in public policy. But since we lost the election in 1980 to Ronald Reagan, I went back and practiced law. And then I realized practicing law is a business, not a profession. Because every month in the partnership meetings, we were just talking about how much money we're making that month or how much we hope to make the next month. And it didn't seem like the profession I thought it was when I went to law school. So I said, if I'm going to be in a business, I might as well be in one that's probably more lucrative than the law. So how did you go from hearing about it, obviously seeing, wow, that sounds really lucrative, to forming a firm? Well, when I had been at the White House, I had made a number of speeches as a young policymaker. And and one of the business groups was a group that was organized by a man famously known as Scarsdale Fats. Scarsdale Fats was a figure in the money game written by Adam Smith. And he actually was a Scarsdale Fats. And this man, his real name was Bob Brimberg, basically organized groups where you would make speeches. And I went to one of them and somebody there reached out to me. His name was Ed Mathias. He was at T. Rowe Price. And I stayed in touch with him. And then gradually, as I began to realize I wasn't a great lawyer and didn't really like it, I stayed in touch with him. And he said, well, why don't you set up a buyout firm or private equity firm in Washington? He knows more about investments than I do. He would help me. And so we put together various people who were likely to work together. And I was going to be doing the legal work for him because I really wasn't an investor. And we couldn't get people would come together. And so uh, it wasn't going anywhere. And then one day, one of my clients, who was the head of uh, taxes at Marriott, 
came to me. He said, I just quit my job at Marriott and I am going to start a private equity firm, the type you've been talking about. I said, great. Who are you going to have as your partner? He said, you. So me, I, I'm <laughs> He said, no, no, I'm going to do it with you. So I gave him an office next to mine and we worked a little bit on how to put it together. And then it came about and that's what happened. How were you thinking about funding the business back then? Well, I didn't really think that much about it. I thought two things. One, Ed Mathias knew people in the investment world and he thought he could introduce me to people and they basically give us some money. And ultimately he did. We had a, four of us at the beginning the person from Marriott, his name was Steve Norris, joined us. Then we went out and he recruited, with my help, another guy from Marriott, Dan Daniello. And then we recruited Bill Conway, who was then the CFO of MCI. And those were the four of us. And, and then we went out to raise money and we raised all of $5 million. And that was what we had to start. How did you think about the private equity landscape back then? Well, there was no landscape and there was no private equity. It was buyouts. There were no private equity firms of the type we're talking about today and big mega firms. There were some firms that were known as leveraged buyout firms. The most prominent of them were Forsman Little, Colbert Kravis Roberts, Gibbons Green was another one. And I think uh, there may have been a few others, but basically they were small firms. And so I didn't really think much of it other than we would try to basically do the same things that others were doing. But our original technique was a little different. We originally bought stakes in public companies, a few of them, and then tried to buy the whole company, never doing anything unfriendly. And so we basically would show up and say, we own 5% of the company. We'd like to take it private. Why don't you do it with us? And sometimes that worked, sometimes that didn't. And so from those humble beginnings, how did it progress from that first $5 million? Well, from the first $5 million, we used that. We had $2 million to operate the company and $3 million to invest. And then, of course, that's not enough to really do anything. So we had to go out and co-invest in each deal. And so we would find a deal. The first deal we did was a deal called uh, Chi Chi's, which was a Mexican restaurant company. And it showed you the difficulties of doing these deal by deal because we would send out information to people saying, here's an NDA. We'd like to buy stakes in this company. Would you like to participate? We found that in one case, somebody actually went ahead and front ran us and started buying the stakes themselves. But we ultimately would buy stakes in companies. And then we would try to then convince them to sell us the company. And in one or two cases that worked, in one or two cases it didn't. We then later, using the track record we sort of had, we went out and we tried to raise a $200 million fund, but that seemed too august. So we concluded that $100 million was all we could raise. And then from that $100 million fund, we co-invested alongside at 600 million. So when we had invested, quote, 700 million, we then thought we could go out and raise a bigger fund. And we, our second fund was about a billion dollars. So in those early co-investors, who were the investors coming alongside you and investing that made up that 100 million? Well, when you start a firm, you basically have concentric circles of your friends, your friends' friends, people you wish were your friends, and things like that. Our first $100 million fund were people who uh, some of the partners in the firm knew. I, I think Westinghouse Credit was a large investor. Frank Carlucci was involved with Westinghouse. And so they were an investor. We had a few Japanese investors. We had one that was a Japanese bank. I had been a lawyer doing some work for Sony and Sony's bank was one that Mitsui Bank that became an investor. And so we had a couple of people we knew. But as I learned early on in the practice of law, and I also learned in the raising of money, when you were Practicing law, at least my experience was, all the people that I had done favors for legally and I met when I was at the White House, none of them became my clients when I was practicing law. All the clients were new people. And the same was true when I was raising money. People I thought would give me money, or I didn't get any money from them. The people I didn't really know, but somebody just introduced me to, I got money from them. And I realized in the course of this that the art of raising money was something that was not as easy as I had thought. And that my three partners at the time were people who had investment experience. I didn't really have any. So to make myself feel useful and maybe to be useful, I said, okay, I'll do the fundraising job. I'll worry about the investors and things like that. So I began to develop a specialty of going out and raising the money. What did you learn over the years that led to success in capital raising? Well, one, you have to show up. Now, Zoom has made that different. But before Zoom, you had to show up. Don't tell people how great you are. Listen to their story. Find out what their interests are. 
be good at follow through, tell them the truth all the time. If there's bad news, make sure you tell them that. And then generally try to engage them in a conversation where they can feel like you are their friend and you're somebody that they could learn something from. In my case, because I was from Washington, D.C., people always wanted to know what was going on in the White House or in Washington. And although my boss, Jimmy Carter, was no longer president in the early 80s, I did know a lot of people in, in Washington. I knew what was going on. And so I would be able to tell people what was going on in Washington. And it's amazing around the world. Everybody cares about what's going on with the federal government. So being knowledgeable and having worked in the White House, I could appear to be maybe more knowledgeable than I really was. And were there any things that you picked up that were more subtle in all those different aspects? You talk about listening to people, following up, all the different things that people go through when they're trying to raise money. I haven't written any books about fundraising, but I'm tempted to do so because when you think about it, there are three types of fundraising. One is for philanthropic, one is for political campaigns, and one is for business. I'd say the easiest is probably political because in many ways, it's a smaller amount of money, typically until they've changed the laws a bit, but it's not that much amount of money. Philanthropic is probably next hardest because you're giving people a sense that they're doing something useful with their money. But when you're raising money for business, it's much harder because you have people that are very carefully looking at what the rate of return is, much more caution, and, and also you have a team of people. If you go to somebody for a philanthropic gift, they generally make the decision themselves. You go to somebody for an investment, they have a team of people and they're fly specking it and it's much more complicated and as maybe it should be. I learned in all these cases that the most important things are be humble, ask for money respectfully, give them some information that they might find useful about Washington or whatever you're doing. Be convinced that what you're asking them to do is something you know a lot about and you're investing your own money in it. And then also, whenever there's bad news that might arise, tell them that as soon as possible. So I didn't think it was that complicated, but I do think that fundraising is something that doesn't have the social status that maybe deal makers have accorded themselves. In other words, if you look at the totem pole of people in the private equity world or in the investment world, people generally don't say, well, I'm really proud to tell you I'm a fundraiser, even though I don't think there's anything wrong with it. But people just really often will say, I don't like to ask for money. You're not probably going to be a good fundraiser if you don't. Now, I had never asked people for money before, but I got into the habit of learning how to do it. And I would say I didn't make a science out of it, but I didn't think it was a terrible thing to do because in the end, in this business, I was hopefully going to get them more money back than they gave me. What are the ways when you're actually asking people for money that made it comfortable for you to put in that ask at the end of the day? I didn't start the meeting by saying, give me some money. I would try to engage them and learn what they were doing, hear their thoughts, tell them what I was thinking about Washington or the economy or what other people had told me about the economy or what's going on in Washington, and try to make them feel like they were more simpatico with you and not just as necessarily somebody who was meeting with a supplicant who was trying to beg money out of them. And so I did develop very close relationships with people who became investors with us, but it didn't always happen that way. I think one of the largest individual investors we ever had, I went to see him nine times and every time he said no. And finally, the 10th time he said, I think he was sorry for me. He just said, okay, I'll give you something. Leave me alone. Then it worked out. He became a gigantic investor over a period of time. But in the end, what was novel about what I was doing was really this. And the reason I became known as a fundraiser was really this. In the private equity world, the conventional way that private equity worked was that you raised a fund more or less every four years or so. It was like a presidential campaign. You do it every four years, and then you go do other stuff during the ensuing years. And that's how private equity worked. I had come up with the idea of doing a different type of business model. And if Carlisle was innovative in anything, it was probably the idea that we would try to create a fidelity or a T. Rowe price of private equity, which is to say, we wouldn't have one buyout fund every four years. We'd have a buyout fund. And then after we raised our second buyout fund and a light bulb went off my head, I said, why don't we have a growth capital fund? Why don't we have a real estate fund? Why don't we have other funds? And so I began to realize that my partners would say, okay, they would oversee it or we'd get people to oversee the investments but you have to go out and raise the money. So I basically would start raising money and we'd have multiple funds. And that's why I got to be known as a fundraiser because I was in the market all the time with products and I have three or four or five funds at any given time. Clearly that's a model that others have obviously adopted as well. Blackstone, uh, KKR, uh, Apollo, among others are all have multiple funds out there. As you thought about that model, Fidelity, call it supermarket, different model for 
private equity and its related asset classes. How did you think about building the culture of the firm? Well, culture is essential to any business, of course. You have a bad culture, you're not going to a great company or a good culture, it can be a very good company. We weren't in Wall Street. None of us had worked in Wall Street. So Wall Street has a, where I, I would say, a cutthroat culture than we thought we had. It was a friendly environment. People made mistakes. We didn't fire them. It was an environment where we were trying to build something together that we thought was different and unusual. So I think it was a pretty friendly culture and one where the founders had an unusual kind of situation. There were initially four of us. And then after about seven years, one left. And so there were three of us. And for 30 plus years, three of us basically ran the company, more or less. And it's unusual to have a partnership go on for 30 some years where the three founders, three people are still in good shape with each other. But we did that because we divided up the responsibilities. One person oversaw one area, one person oversaw another, and we didn't get in each other's way, though we would meet frequently to make sure we were coordinated. How do you think about the trajectory of those different strategies over the years, starting with those original leverage buyouts? Well, the buyout business was the one we started in. And clearly, the buyout business turned out to be a very good business because you do enormous amounts of due diligence and you pretty much are likely to make a reasonable rate of return if you don't get over leveraged. And obviously, sometimes you over leverage and every buyout doesn't work. But I would say 90% of the times buyouts will work. Venture capital, which we were not really in, probably 90% of those deals didn't work. Now it seems like every venture deal works, but that wasn't the case then. And then real estate was a lower rate of return business, but a more a predictable rate of return, probably. We did have a growth capital business for a while, and then we began getting into debt businesses. But then the innovation that really made us more global was that I decided that I would try to build a global firm with the help of my partners, and I would go to Europe and recruit Europeans to run a European fund that would be part of Carlisle. And then after Europe, I would go to Asia, then Japan. And then we did the rest of the world, Latin America, Middle East, and, and Africa as well. And so we, going around recruiting people and then overseeing it was a, a big undertaking. At the time, there were no other global private equity firms that were, were doing this, which is to say, going ahead and trying to build a, a global business. The ones that have now done it, they didn't do it before we did. What was your recruiting pitch? Well, when we started going around the world, I went to Europe. I had used some headhunters. They identified people. And I'd say, look, we're going to try something novel. We're going to have Europeans investing in Europe, not a bunch of Yankees coming over here. We'll have an investment committee that's centralized, so we'll have to get some central approval. But basically, you guys will be able to have our brand name, which was getting to be better than it was. It wasn't famous. And then when it worked in Europe, we then went to Asia and then Japan and so forth. And it was a model that that worked. I would say we made some mistakes for sure. If I had to do it all over again, I would do it differently. But we did some things that I think worked, and we recruited some very talented people. What were some of those key mistakes? Well, I'd say in the end, I recruited some people that were great and some people I made mistakes on, I think, they didn't work out as well. We probably didn't recognize fully that the culture is different everywhere. And so some deals were more likely to be ones that seemed appropriate in Europe, but maybe not in America. So we had to make sure we understood the local cultures maybe better than we initially did. But in the end, I I think it worked out. I think there are things we could have done differently and done better in hindsight. I wish we had done many different things than what we did. But on the whole, we, we built something from scratch and worked out reasonably well. If you broke down that 30-year history in half, if you go back and look at that first half, 15 years in, you were significant, but call it $14, 15000000000 in assets, mostly known for leverage buyouts, a lot of defense-related things. And then in that back half, you take it from $14 billion to where we are today, quarter of a trillion or something like that. What was that inflection point? Well, there are several inflection points. As we were building the global business, a lot of our peers, people who have built bigger firms than us, but people who are well-known as well, hadn't yet done that. Blackstone, KKR, and Apollo really hadn't built international businesses, honestly, at that time, as we were beginning to do it. And people began to make fun of us, saying we're just a franchisor, We were just setting up franchises, which we didn't do because everybody was in a Carlisle employee. We weren't franchising anything, and we had to approve all the deals centrally and so forth. I'd say I wish we had done some things differently, gone in some areas more quickly, not gone in some areas. But on the whole, it was a business model of basically building a global private equity firm where you were taking advantage of the talents and skills of the people we had throughout the firm. Today, as the world has evolved, 
the large firms, we all have a cadre of former chief executives, CFOs, COOs, who are helping grow the value of these companies. Uh, in the early days of buyouts, as you may remember, it was more or less a leverage game. You were highly leveraging something and hoping you could make a few changes before the economy went against you and then you would exit. And ESG was not a factor. And other kinds of things that today are important are not were not even considered then as that relevant. And today, we are really a more than a value-added business, and we make our profits mostly by growing EBITDA and not by just using financial engineering. When did you start bringing in these operating professionals to help with the portfolio companies? We started doing that maybe 20 plus years ago or so, but other firms were doing that as well. And I think some had different models. And KKR's model was to have a separate company at one point that was providing the consulting services. Other firms were doing it differently. We called them different things, operating executives, senior executives, whatever it might be. And all of them had some value to add. Some were better at sourcing deals. Some were better at overseeing deals. Some were better at helping educate a bit the CEOs who were operating under leverage and so forth for the first time. So I think it's a model that has worked. And the value added today is pretty considerable when you work with one of these firms. We also, all of us began to do things like help them with procurement. We'd help them with IT. We'd help them with ESG, all the kinds of things that they maybe hadn't focused on. We have teams of people that can now help them do that. How did you evolve to leading and managing this global team of professionals? Well, I wouldn't say it was perfect because we made some mistakes, but the way it worked is that Bill Conway, who I'd recruited from MCI, he was our chief investment officer. And so he was overseeing all the transactions and I was on the investment committees, but I was deferring to him on the deals more, more or less. Dan Daniello, the other partner, was doing a lot of the administrative and operational things, but also specializing in real estate and our energy businesses. And I was more or less doing fundraising, recruiting. I was more or less the face of the firm because I was willing to make speeches and, and those kind of things. And, and so I was more of the outside person and the other guys were more the inside person and they didn't resent my being better known. And I didn't resent their having to do all the drudgery work that I thought you had to do on the inside. So it worked out reasonably well. We would meet probably once a week or so to kind of coordinate, but it was very loose and it was something that you couldn't have predicted necessarily would have worked. What did you learn about leadership that worked well for Carlo? In leadership, I think it's important to share the credit it's important to let other people who have the right skill sets have the responsibilities in the areas they know. It's important to not get into fights with people. The three founders, I don't think, ever really had any shouting matches or anything like that. Sometimes we disagree, but we just recognize it was important that we stay together because if we were fighting with each other, people would know about it. Now, of course, we didn't always agree. And so there was always some forum shopping where if I didn't like something, somebody might go to Bill and say, well, David doesn't like this, but you like it. And vice versa, that happened from time to time. As you know, if you're a parent, you know that happens from time to time where children are forum shopping between their mother and father. As you have these trade-offs with decisions of things you want that Bill thinks differently, how did you create decision-making processes at the firm level? Well, we generally deferred to the person who was the area specialty. So if I was fundraising, I would generally, they would say, okay, if you think this is worth doing, if you want to go raise money from these people or take money from these people or whatever it might be, fine, or bringing these people to help with fundraising. So I did recruit a number of people who are well-known and they really were helping with fundraising. And Bill would really make the decisions about whether we should do the deals or not, if they're buyouts or things like that. Dan did that in real estate typically. A lot of the organizations, when you grow and scale as you have, people want to find roles for the team members to grow and expand, raise different products, different people running different areas. As you recruited, it sounds like, at least in the early going, you were recruiting new people to run new businesses. How did you balance sort of bringing in outside people to the firm from people that you may have developed from the ground up? Well, it's always a matter of tension because if you're in an organization, you always think that you can run more or do more. And then if somebody at the top says, well, we want to bring in somebody to run it, it might cause some tensions. But what we tended to do is we would create these new funds and go out and recruit new people to run those funds. But occasionally we would, might promote somebody from within. But we were doing global funds. I wanted to have people who were living in the native country that we're dealing with. Though we did, from time to time, we did send people over to Europe or Asia 
to kind of give some of them our culture, but they were there for a temporary period of time and they would come back. There's always a, a challenge whether you should promote from within or hire people on the outside. I was a summer associate at a law firm in New York called Cravath, Swain & Moore, and they had a famous policy of always promoting from within and never taking laterals. Other large law firms would be bringing lateral partners in. I was at Paul Weiss for a couple of years in New York and a very excellent law firm, but they would bring in lateral partners who were well-known in certain areas. We did recruit well-known people who had been former government people for a while, and they were very visible people. And that was a plus and a minus. But in the end, I think it was a plus. Where do those, those sort of friction get created over the years, particularly with people that join you maybe early on in their careers and stayed for a while? Did you have a stream of turnover or how'd that play out? Well, everybody doesn't work out in every organization. And so sometimes you've got to make changes. Bill and I, when it was our responsibility to tell somebody to go, we tended to promote them rather than have them go. So I think ultimately Dan took over the job of segueing people out of the firm when they weren't working out. So we were always turned over that responsibility to him. When some people are good, but not great, you tend not to get rid of them and they kind of move forward at a slower pace. They might resent the fact that you bring in somebody over them, but this happens in life all the time in businesses. I would say we had a pretty happy culture. Many people were at our firm for 20 years. Some, some people were in our firm for 25 years, 30 years. So it, it's a pretty happy culture. It wasn't a cutthroat. We could have made more money and been more profitable had we been more cutthroat in, in hindsight. We just tended to be a little more, more loose about things and we weren't trying to upset people unduly. So in the path to creating this fidelity, somewhere along the way, I imagine you created products that didn't work as well. What did you learn from those experiences? Well, we did that many times. There were two types of products, products that investors didn't really want, and then products where we weren't really good at doing what we had raised the money for. So we were not tough enough at times to say, okay, it's not working. We would try to make it work, and ultimately, it would limp along. More recently, we've been better at saying this isn't working or it's subscale. I'll give you an example. We had somebody wanted to put up a lot of money for us to invest in, let's say, Ireland, which is just one country. It's a small country. And we, we had a fair amount of money from a government-related source and some local institutions. So we, we had a fund in Ireland. And they performed spectacularly well, but it was so small, it couldn't move the needle. So we ultimately, it's now independent and raising their, their own money as an independent fund. The same is true in a number of other areas. We had a Middle East fund. And finding deals in the Middle East was difficult. It was hard to raise money for a Middle East fund because people in the Middle East wanted to get their money out of the Middle East, and people outside of the Middle East didn't want to invest in the Middle East, at least in private equity. So it was probably profitable, but not so much so that you could really build a big business in it. In the end, if you look at the large firms that we're now talking about, and I'll use the four big ones, Blackstone, Carlisle, KKR, and Apollo, they make 95% of their money in the developed markets. I'm counting China and India, I suppose, is developed for this purpose. Very few of them have made money of any consequence in Africa, the Middle East, Latin America, to some extent, Southeast Asia. It's just that the velocity of deals, the size of deals, and the expertise are so much greater in the developed markets that in the end, if you look at where the profits are coming from, and now it's true of us, they're really coming from the developed markets, the major in countries in Asia, including Japan. North America and Western Europe. That's where the profits are really being made. And I'd say that even in the US, it's disproportionate how much of their profits are coming for all these large firms from the United States. One of the biggest differences across those firms as well is in the strategies. So all started in private equity or leverage buyouts. Blackstone has this huge hedge fund presence. You see much less of that in Apollo, KKR, and Carlisle. Curious your thoughts on the extensions of leverage buyouts to these different areas and where you've seen success and failure. Well, some have worked well and some have not. Blackstone built a, a very big real estate business. I think it's their most, most profitable business. KKR was late to the real estate area. We built a hedge fund of funds that didn't really work out. So Blackstone built a gigantic one. It worked out well. We built out global private equity businesses around the world and other firms really probably didn't do it quite that way. I'd say any business, when you're starting a new product, it doesn't always work. And so you have to be willing to experiment, but you have to be cognizant of the fact that if it doesn't work, you've got to make a decision about maybe ending it or doing something that doesn't lose money. The other commonality of those four firms today is that they're all public companies. 
and curious to hear about your path with Carlisle going public and the positives and negatives you've experienced since. Well, that would be a whole book. I remember I was talking to Steve Schwartz one time about taking these firms public, and Steve said he wasn't going to do it, but then ultimately he changed his mind, of course. I had thought it would be a good way to deal with it because I, I thought as these firms got to be bigger and bigger, but the partnership structure was a little unwieldy. I also thought that it was a good way to kind of ultimately segue out the senior people and have the more junior people ultimately rise up. When you have a public company, you have stock in the company that the founders and the senior people have. Once you have that stock, it's something that they have once it's vested, and then they can ultimately decide to sell it and retire, whatever it might be. If you don't have that format, you often have tensions between the founders and the non-founders as to when the founders are going to leave and let the younger people get a bigger piece of the pie. And there's always some kind of tensions there. Now, when Dial Capital and similar firms came along buying stakes in these firms, that was a way to mitigate some of the problems because they could buy stakes in firms that didn't want to go public or weren't big enough to go public, but could deal with the founder issue. Founders want to feel like they get rewarded for what they built. But if you don't have a, somebody selling a piece of the stake in the firm and you don't go public, in the end, the founders are going to probably get squeezed out a bit and probably feel they didn't get adequately rewarded for what they built. How about the challenges from an LP perspective of needing to serve a different constituency and shareholders as a public company that may not be the case as a private company? It's a big challenge for sure, because when you're focusing on LPs, limited partners in your funds, they want the highest rate of return that you can legally get them. And they focus on internal rates of return and they focus on MOICs or multiples of invested capital they don't focus on your fee-related earnings. It turns out when you go public, the people on Wall Street, the analysts, they care about more or less two things. One is predicting where you're going to be every quarter before you get there, and two, continuously growing that number every quarter. And so the best way to grow a number every quarter is to grow your assets under management and charge the fees you can and just keep growing assets under management. If the investment performance isn't spectacular, they tend not to be as focused on that. In the long term, your investment focus isn't good or performance isn't good, you, you won't get more money. But if your performance is good enough to growing assets, you can make a lot of money off the fees. When Carlisle first went public, we were well known, but we weren't as highly valued as Blackstone because we had not focused on fees that much. None of us could come from Wall Street. We were not famous for the fee world. And so we tended to not be as good at that as some other people. And we tended to focus on the IRRs, which was our focus. So we probably struggled for a while as a public company till we went to the point where we realized, as we have now and are doing a good job at it, that you have to serve two masters. The masters that buy your stock are interested in growing earnings, which is typically fee-related earnings, and growing them every quarter in a fairly consistent way. And the people that invest in your funds are more interested in the rates of return that you're getting for them. So it's a difficult balancing act. And obviously, most people have chosen not to do it. Most private equity firms are private. So as you took on that additional challenge, how did you evolve the nature of the activities at Carlisle to address that balance? Well, in the end, we did focus more on what Wall Street was interested in. But we always recognized that in the end, if your investors and your funds are not happy, everything falls apart. So we always were focused on our investors and our funds. And we said in, in the early days as a public company that we focus on our investors and our funds. And if they're happy, that you should be happy as well at public shareholders. But I would say we probably were not as attentive to some of the needs of Wall Street in the early days as maybe we should have been. And that was probably my fault more than anybody else's fault. I was the co-CEO with Bill Conway and we did worry about our investors a lot. And that was what we knew much better, but we've made changes. And now I think our market cap now reflects a greater recognition of those issues that Wall Street cares about are important to us as well. So I want to turn back a little bit to this public company ownership question. And so it's a real subtle balance between the founders building something and wanting to derive the economic value of that. And then as they move on, this sort of next generation coming up, how does the explicit monetization of that stake through stock impact the mindset of the people sort of below the level that had, say, a meaningful windfall when Carlisle went public? 
Well, there's no doubt that in any organization, if it's successful, the founders will tend to do better than the non-founders. That's true in all businesses. The founders of the private equity firms have all become major firms have become obviously wealthy and they tend to like staying there. And most of the founders that have built these large firms are more or less still there, even though like me, they're in their seventies, maybe they're not running it day to day, but they tend to still be involved because they have large stakes. And you have to ask yourself always, when can you actually sell these stakes? So if you own a large part of a Carlisle or Blackstone, when is it appropriate to sell without making people think you don't think the company's future is very good? It's not clear to me what that age is and so forth. So it's always a bit of a tension. But in the end, if you join a large private equity firm and you work your way up, you realize what you're getting into, which is to say you're not going to get the wealth, most likely, of the founders. Though On the other hand, some people that have risen up in some of these firms, John Gray, now the president of, of Blackstone, based on public information, he's obviously done quite well. And he owns a fair bit of it. Of course, he created a great business, the real estate business. But as a general rule of thumb, people who work in organizations don't generally make as much money as people who build them. Now, that's changed as some of the values of companies have increased. For example, Tim Cook was not a gigantic shareholder, relatively speaking, uh, of Apple. Now his stake, according to things I've read recently, is multi-billion stake. And he's obviously earned it by doing a very good job. But I'd say if you are determined to make enormous amounts of money and not be hoping that you'll rise up and get wealth because you're an employee, you tend to leave and you start your own firm. So Blackstone, Carlisle, KKR, Apollo have all had people leave and start very successful private equity firms. Some of them have done extraordinarily well, some less well. But it's just true of any business that sometimes people have a, a willingness to be an entrepreneur and start. And sometimes people say, look, I'm making a lot of money by normal human standards. I like the prestige of the firm I'm at. I like the people. I don't need to be worth X billion dollars. I'm happy with, with what I have. And so it's just no different than any other business, really. How are you thinking about the various challenges to, say, the traditional business now, private equity, leverage buyouts today? Well, there's different challenges. Challenge one is that private equity has done well, not, as I like to kiddingly say, because of the charm and good looks of the founders of these firms. It's done well because the rates of return have generally outperformed everything else that you can measure. There's that gap between what private equity firms can do and public market firms can do or ETFs can do. You know, if that gap narrows too much, people won't want to be in the illiquidity that private equity entails or the higher fees that private equity entails. Right now, the gap is big enough so that people think that if they're in a pretty good private equity fund, they'll do better than they would do in a public market fund. But if they're in a top quartile venture fund or, or growth capital fund or buyout fund, they'll do extremely well. And so uh, I think that gap will be there for a while because of the economic incentives and so forth. But there's no doubt that the, the industry will evolve and nobody would have predicted that they'd have these kind of firms 20 years ago or 30 years ago. And so we'll have to see how the industry evolves. But there's no doubt that the people that set up the private equity world many years ago came up with some clever ideas we're still using, which is to say capital is committed over a period of time, called down over a period of time. 20% of the profits or some equivalent in venture can be 30%, go to the people who are creating the investment opportunities and so forth. Now they're preferred returns and other kinds of things that help make certain that it's as equitable as possible for the, the carried interest is collected. But I, I'd say it, it will no doubt evolve. I, as we go forward, I suspect you'll see more and more competition from family offices that are large and they will do deals competing with private equity firms. You'll see, as we already have seen, more people using the Canadian model, so-called, where you go out and do deals directly as a pension fund or a sovereign wealth fund equivalent. I think you'll see more and more of those kind of changes. And again, remember, I would say 65% or so of all the deals done in the private equity world are more or less still done in the developed markets. So you've got enormous growth potential in the emerging markets that private equity still has just begun to scratch the surface of. So you've probably talked to more senior leaders at your investors, the LPs, than just about anyone I know. And I'm curious what advice you give a CIO today in a seat where you're looking out at the world of opportunities, whether you're sitting on an investment committee or just in a one-on-one -on -one conversation about how you've seen people successfully navigate one of these pools of capital. Well, I tell people the most important thing in investing is not to lose what you have. Secondly, take appropriate risks for the amount of money that you have. 
Three, try to realize what kind of rate of return you're looking for. If you're looking for 100% IRR, it's different than looking for a 10% IRR. Next, make sure you know what your own internal cash needs are. So how much money you need to have coming back to run your life or your business or whatever it might be. And then always get as much information as you can and have as much communication as you can with the people that you invest with. And so private equity is a, an asset class that people make a lot of money in and investors are generally happy with it. But these are people that work hard at it. They do a lot of research. They do a lot of due diligence. They may make some mistakes, but generally, I, I would say the industry of figuring out which funds to go in has become very large and very well defined. And generally, the biggest mistakes are made by people who make investments in areas they don't know much about or where they are investing with some people that don't know much about what they're investing in. But as a general rule of thumb, if you do your own due diligence, you may not get the number one performing fund all the time, but you're not likely to get the 1,000th performing either. The best performance of any private equity fund in any given vintage year will almost certainly be three guys or three women in a garage in Palo Alto who come up with a new venture fund, and all of a sudden they make 25 times their money. But you're not going to know about them, probably, most likely. And so you've got to not look for those kind of things so regularly, or if you do, you can do it sparingly because they all don't always work out. Some people don't like to invest in first funds because it's thought to be more dangerous. In my family office, I invest an enormous number of first funds because I think they're smaller and they probably need me more and I can probably pay more attention to what they're doing and there'll be more co-investment opportunities and so forth. But first funds do have their challenges for sure. So I want to turn to some of your more recent activities it seems to interviewing the writing, your own family office, that you may have taken a slight step back from your engagement in Carlisle. What was your thought process over the last couple of years? Well, a couple of things. I recruited Lou Gerson to be the chairman of Carlisle, and he was retiring at IBM at the normal retirement age. It was 60 years old. My father was a blue collar worker, and the day you're allowed to retire as a blue collar worker from the post office, he did. It was 55. Now we have a president of the United States who's 78 years old. So the world has kind of changed. But I thought that when I turned 68, and Bill Conway is exactly the same age as me, almost the same birthday practically, when we turned 68, we said we have some talented people who are ready to help run this company and really run it. And if we stay here forever, maybe they'll leave and we won't have the benefit of their leadership. And so we decided to step back and make ourselves initially co executive chairs, now co chairs. And so we are gigantic shareholders and have enormous net worth tied up in the firm, but we decided to step back a bit and we're still on the investment committees and do other things, but day to day, we're not running it. And it seems that I've worked out. Our stock price has done much better under this way than, than when Bill and I were running it. So I guess I'm happy about that. But I decided when you reach a certain age, you can pretend you're going to live forever, but be realistically, humans don't live forever. And assessing my family's genes and and all the other kind of things. I thought I probably could go at a reasonable pace in my 70s. And my parents both made it to their mid 80s. So maybe I could get there. But then you say, what do you want to do with the rest of your life? Do you just want to make more money and do the same thing? Or do you want to do something different? So I decided to enjoy my bucket list that I had and do other things. So writing, interviewing, things like that, and then setting up a family office. And I'm involved with all three of my children are in private equity. And you can argue that I did a bad job as a parent or a good job as a parent, depending on your point of view, but they're all involved in private equity. And I'm working with each of them in that. So the pleasure of working with your children, pleasure of doing things different that aren't seen as just making money. And then I do have a large philanthropic program that I'm involved with. So all those things make me happy. And as you know, happiness is the hardest thing to get in life. And so I'm pretty happy. So let's walk through that. You've been writing books at a relatively furious pace in the last few years. How do you think about what you want to write next? Well, I have a format that works for me, which is to say I do interviews of people on television or Zoom. I then edit them down with the help of somebody and then write a summary of my relationship with the person or what they've said. Then I do an introduction. And I can do that at a pace of about one a year. I wish I had started when I was 50 because I'd have more books out there. But I enjoy doing this in the different areas that I'm interested in. So my next book will be coming out in the September. It's called The American Experiment. It's about the effort to put this country together and the genes that I, as I call it, that have made us so different than other countries, the good and the bad, and then how they have had problems from time to time with some of these genes not working as well as they should have. But generally that, it's a series of interviews with wide ranging historians or 
famous people in our country's history. And then I have another book coming out next year on investing, where I've interviewed some of the great investors in the world, really. And I'll talk about the art of investing. And then I have some others that I'll be working on as well, relating to philanthropy or other public policy things I'm interested in. I enjoy doing that. I chair the Kennedy Center, which is the Performing Arts Center in the United States Capitol. And I chair the Council on Foreign Relations. I did chair the Duke University Board. And I am now on the University of Chicago Board. I'm on the Harvard Corporation Board. So I enjoy that and those things. And I have a lot of other boards I'm involved with in the medicine area and education area. So that's a good mix of things I, I'm trying to do. But in the end, I recognize that the trick is to stay alive and with your all of your faculties. And so my biggest weakness is I don't exercise quite enough. I have the exercise by osmosis theory, which is if I buy a lot of equipment, I look at it a lot, it'll rub <laughs> off on me. But so far, that no evidence of that. On the other hand, I wasn't a great athlete when I was younger. I was great until I was seven or eight. And then I kind of peaked at that age. And my friends who became All-American athletes, they've now had body parts removed. They have artificial knees, artificial hips, because they were so good when they were younger that they wore their body parts out. I didn't have that. So now if I play tennis with my All-American friends, I can beat them because they can barely hobble across the court because they have artificial hips or artificial knees. So maybe there's an advantage to it. I don't know. How do you dedicate both as much time and resources to this wide swath of philanthropic organizations that you do. How do you think about that in almost like a portfolio context? I'm on a lot of boards more than I probably should be, but I love everyone I'm on. And I've been the chair of many of these boards. And when you're the chair, you have certain responsibilities. So my standards though, generally are these. One, I'd like to remind people that philanthropy is derived from an ancient Greek word that means loving humanity. It doesn't mean rich people writing checks. And if you're going to love humanity and do something, it isn't just a matter of writing a check. Sitting, serving on the board, serving as a chair, I think is a very good way to enhance your philanthropic interest and so forth. My standards are these. Number one, can I start something that wouldn't otherwise get started? Can I finish something that wouldn't otherwise get finished? Can I likely live long enough to see the impact of what I'm doing? And also, can I, fourth, can I stay intellectually engaged with the subject so that I am willing to really be involved and not just show up at a meeting from time to time? And so you know, the things I'm involved with, I do tend to get actively involved. So when I was the chair of the Duke University Board for four years, I found that would be spectacular. And I loved what I was doing. I, Duke had given me a scholarship when I was younger. I was the chair of the Smithsonian Board for three years. And the Smithsonian was something I went to as a young boy. And I think it's a great organization. I've chaired the Kennedy Center board now, I guess, for 11 or 12 years, and I'd still be involved for a while. And I think it's something I enjoy a great deal. Council on Foreign Relations gives me access to foreign leaders around the world. and makes me knowledgeable about what's going on around the world. And I will probably do some other things that will be announced soon in terms of some other organization I might chair or lead. But I, I enjoy it. It keeps me young. I wish I didn't have to dye my hair gray. My hair is dark as yours, but I dye it gray so people <laughs> think I'm age appropriate. Gradually, I'm beginning to look older. And when you look older, people look at you differently, but I'm still trying to be vibrant as much as I can. I'd love to talk to you about your journey with interviewing, about the David Rubenstein show, television with Bloomberg. What have you learned from conducting interviews in this way as distinct from all the many conversations you had over the years? Well, everybody has a story and most people enjoy talking about themselves the most commonly used word in the English language is I. And that's because people like me like talking about themselves. So I think I'd like to give people a chance to talk about themselves. I try, if you've watched my interviews, to do it in a way that never embarrasses anybody, never makes them uncomfortable, and try to intersperse humor, because I found that humor, particularly self-deprecating humor, generally works. So I enjoyed it. And it came about by happenstance, like most things in life, for example, you're doing this interview of me now. I assume it's from happenstance that led you to do these kind of interviews. You didn't wake up one morning and an epiphany came from heaven saying, I should do this. It just kind of happened this way. So the same with me. I, I was inviting a lot of famous people to come to Carlisle events, investor conferences, paying them large speaker fees. And they were very famous people. And I found out that they weren't such great speakers. They were famous, but not great speakers. So I, I decided to just interview them. It'd be easier. And their speaking agent would say, well, is the same fee. I said, same fee. I'll just do the interview. They said, fine. They don't have to prepare. So I, I would make people funny. and It was good. So then I became the president of the Economic Club of Washington. And my same job was to get speakers to come in. They were boring. I decided to stop that and interview them. And then that led to a TV show and that led to other things. And so 
It was by happenstance and serendipity, but I enjoy it. And the reason I enjoyed it is the same reason you enjoyed is one, you have to be intellectually sharp. So you've got to prepare. Preparing means reading. It keeps your gray matter active. Two, you can learn something from people. Three, you might be inspired by some people. Four, it's a way of staying relevant. There was a very important person who was in our firm for a while, and he's still alive. He's 90 years old now, Arthur Levitt. And he was the chairman of the SEC. And he was always saying to me, and he still does, I think he's still active in a number of areas, and a very smart man. He said what he really wanted to do when he retired from the SEC and other things is to stay relevant, to do things that you feel like you're doing something relevant, making the world a little better place or something. And I guess I have the same feeling. I'd like to be relevant and still do things so that people feel like you have something to contribute to society. So to some extent, as you know, the joy of doing interviewing is that you get to meet a wide array of people. You learn a lot. It keeps you in touch with a wide number of kind of different areas. So it's actually a, a wonderful thing. And the, the sad thing about it is, to some extent, it's an art form that didn't exist for much of organized history. So we don't have any interviews of George Washington. There are no interviews of Abraham Lincoln. We would love to see an interview of Cleopatra or Henry VIII. We don't have those because people didn't invent that style. And it really started probably as a form of entertainment and information, maybe in the early 50s or something like that in television in the United States on the late night or the Tonight Show or things like that. You know, there are obviously people have been interviewed for litigation and other kinds of things, but for a form of entertainment and information that people would want to watch, it didn't really start until the early 50s. I'm really curious, and a number of the people you interview have had not just remarkable careers, but do all kinds of interesting things. How do you go about preparing for those interviews? Well, I do interviews in a way that journalists would not probably like, but what I do is this. I read as much as I can. If they've written a book, I will certainly read it. If I'm interviewing an author, I think it's a courtesy to read the book of the author. So I always read the book, and that keeps me active in reading a lot of books, which is good. I prepare questions, and I prepare them myself. I don't have somebody do them. I prepare them in the way my brain thinks. And so then I give the questions to them. Now, journalists will never do that because they think that's inappropriate and so forth. It doesn't bother me. I give them the questions. But I like to have the questions, and I guess sort of like we're having this conversation, I give them the questions, and they kind of reflect my thinking, but I then don't read the questions. Because I think when you read the questions, you have a not a conversation, but it's like an interview, and it's in a kind of different way. Since I wrote the questions, I can remember pretty much how they went, because my brain put the questions together, so I'll get 90% of them in. And then as Oprah told me when I interviewed her, the key to being a good interviewer is being a good listener. So listen to what the person says and take off on that and don't just go down your list of questions. And so I prepare by doing a lot of reading, by thinking through the questions and trying to make an enjoyable experience for the person, not a torturous kind of thing. I don't want them to feel like they're going to the dentist. Not that dentists are terrible, but (laughs) I don't want it to be a root canal. I I shouldn't say that my root canal specialist probably tells me that I just offended all root canal specialists, but root canals generally are not thought to be the most pleasant of experiences. (laughs) I want to turn to a couple of closing questions. Before that, though, I'm really curious about how you thought about Declaration Partners, your family office. You've been involved in the business for a long time, and you set up this investment office. How do you think about it alongside of your interest in Carlisle? Well, Carlisle is where the bulk of my net worth was and probably still is. But People would always ask me, do you have a family office? And I ultimately got what I call family office envy. I didn't have family office. I kind of felt like naked. I don't have a family office. Everybody else I know has a family office. So I got to have a family office. But seriously, I decided I would do it for a couple of reasons. One, I can diversify. Carla doesn't invest in every area. Two, I could be more involved in some ways by taking bigger risk if it's my money. I don't have a fiduciary responsibility to outsiders. So I could take some risks that I probably didn't, wouldn't do at Carlisle. Three, I can probably be more engaged in the investment process to some extent, though I have some constraints in what I can do, but I just thought I would be different. Also, one of my children works there, and so it's a way to work with one of my children, and another child has a connection to it as well, so that's helpful, and a third may as well in the future. In addition, I like being with young people. I like recruiting young people. I like, and I just thought I'm maybe better at building something than maybe running it, so I could help build something. The person that you know and I know as I, I recruited to run it, Brian Frank, has done a terrific job. And so I'm in touch with what they're doing. And I feel it's a part of a new organization and it's done extremely well and diversified my, my net worth. And so I'm pretty happy with it. 
All right, David, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions and then let you go. So first, what is your favorite hobby or activity outside of work and family? Being on your show. Of course. Yeah, I would have expected that. <laughs> I guess, what do I get most excited about? Watching Duke basketball. I'm a Duke graduate. So watching Duke basketball is one of my favorite outside activities or things I enjoy. Interviewing people is something I enjoy. Reading books is something I really enjoy. And when I can find a place that's flat, I can walk, so I don't have to walk up hills. I enjoy walking and listening to books on audio, tape, or music. And those are the kind of things I like to do and relaxing. So I know you're a voracious reader and it boggles my mind to think of a hundred books a year, but in the last year, what has been your favorite book? Other than my own books, right? Of course. Well, yeah. The reason I can read that many books is one, I'm forcing myself to do it because I'm often interviewing the authors. Secondly, I read books in areas I know something about, biographies, history, business, politics, those kind of things. So it's not like I'm, I'm reading something that's foreign to me. So it's not that complicated. There's a book by... Uh, Peter Baker and his wife, Susan Glazer, on Jim Baker, who was in our firm for many years. I think it's called The Man Who Ran Washington, a spectacular book, and I really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed interviewing David Blight about his book on Frederick Douglass. I, it won the Pulitzer Prize, a spectacular book. I enjoyed that. And an interesting book that people maybe not have heard of as much, and I didn't know as much about it, is Ted Widmer wrote a book about Lincoln's journey from Springfield to Washington, where he was almost assassinated when he was getting ready to be sworn in as president. So there's a, some books I've read and I enjoy, and, but there's so many others as well. What's your most important daily habit? Going out and buying the newspapers. I am not a person that likes to read newspapers online. So wherever I am, I'm trying to always locate uh, newspaper stores so I can go buy them in person. And so then read them. And so I probably every day I'm going somewhere to buy newspapers. And, and if I'm in some place where I can't buy them physically, I go into withdrawal. What's the set of newspapers that you read? I read every day religiously the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, the Financial Times, and my favorite, the New York Post. How much time does that take you? I generally try to read about 40 minutes in the morning, and then kind of during the course of the day, we'll go through it. And then at the end of the day, I'll go through the stuff I hadn't read. What's your biggest personal pet peeve? Well, I wrote an article about it, and people told me they agreed with me. It's leaf blowers. So I, in my house, and see, I'm in a house here in Bethesda. And it seems like 24 hours a day, people want to move their leaves around. I can't figure out what the obsession is <laughs> moving your leaves from one part of your yard to another part of your yard or doing something with them. Nature could take care of your leaves, but they get very noisy. And I think somebody should invent a muffler for leaf blowers. <laughs> What's your biggest investment pet peeve? Well, the mistakes that I made in not pursuing Mark Zuckerberg when he was at Harvard, when my now son-in-law was prepared to introduce me to him, or when we kind of sold our stake in Amazon at the IPO. And then also a young man showed up in our office one time with a crazy idea that he was going to help navigate the internet in an easy way. And we didn't know what the internet was. And that was, of course, Mark Andreessen and Jim Clark. And we told him that they didn't know what they were doing. Uh, I wish I had done those deals. <laughs> what two people have had the biggest impact on your professional life? Well, I went to work at the White House for a man named Stuart Eisenstadt. I worked for him for four years, a very hardworking person. So he gave me a chance to work in the White House and that opened things for me. I'd say my two partners, Bill Conway and Dan Daniello, we've been in business for 30 years together, and probably they've had an enormous impact because we worked together as partners for all these years and built a good company. What teaching from your parents has most stayed with you? Probably to try to respect others for what they do and don't be bragging about how great you are all the time and try to remain humble and try to do what you can to help other people if you're able to do so. All right, David, last one. What life lesson have you learned that you wish you knew a lot earlier in life? That the key to the future of life is going to be owning podcasts and doing podcasts. And I wish I had gone to college and said, I'm going to be a podcaster. And then I could have built a podcast empire, but I didn't know that. Now, to be very serious, I would say I wish I had learned as a young man to not as tunnel vision on one or two things. I'm not as diversified as I might appear to you. And I wish I had greater talents in certain areas. I probably wish I had learned much more about some of the things I'm now learning about when I was younger, learn how to play a musical instrument, learn more to appreciate art, learn more about how to appreciate music, learn more about uh, culture than I, I'm now catching up, but I probably should have done more about it when I was younger. David, thanks so much for taking the time. My pleasure. Thanks very much for inviting me. Thanks for listening to this episode. I hope you found a nugget or two to take away and apply in your investing and your life. If you'd like what you heard, 
please tell a friend and maybe even write a review on iTunes. You'll help others discover the show, and I thank you for it. Have a good one, and see you next time. 